All right, so we're doing central nervous system. This is one of the big lectures. So first of all, off, let's talk about embryonic development. <clears throat> so we're going to have our neural tube, which breaks into its primary vesicles, which are the prosencephalon, mesencephalon, and rhombencephalon. The prosencephalon will break into the telencephalon and diencephalon. The mesencephalon is going to break into the mesencephalon. It stays right there. And then rhombencephalon will form our metencephalon and myelencephalon. Your telencephalon will make your cerebral hemispheres, your cortex, your white matter, and your basal nucleus. So this is like higher level thinking stuff as your uh, telencephalon. Diencephalon is going to be your thalamus, hypothalamus, epithalamus, and vision. So this will be like emotions. Meso and uh, mesencephalon is going to be your midbrain. Metencephalon is going to be your pons and cerebellum. And then your myelencephalon will be your medulla. So these guys, so the mesencephalon, metencephalon, and myelencephalon form up your brainstem. Your prosencephalon forms the higher brain. So with the adult brain, there's going to be four main regions. The cerebral hemispheres, the diencephalon, the brain stem, which is going to be midbrain, pons, and the medulla, and then your cerebellum. With your CNS, it's going to be broken up into three main regions, basically, a little bit more. So we have our spinal cord and we're gonna have the brain alright with the spinal cord we're gonna see down here there's a central gray the central part here is gray with an outer white matter and then there's gonna be a layer of gray matter along the outside so we get our central cavity with our inner gray matter and we got white matter all around it with the brain it's gonna be similar but there's going to be little areas of gray matter. Those will be nuclei in the cerebellum. They'll be found in the cortex, all right, and they'll be found in the cerebrum. So they're going to be kind of found all over. Those will be little nuclei of gray matter. Okay, with the brain, it's going to have ventricles. So this big horn-looking thing here, this is the lateral ventricle. So this and this. Are the lateral ventricle. It's going to have its anterior horn. It's going to have its inferior horn. Here you see the anterior horn and the inferior horn and then on the lateral view you also see the posterior horn. This guy looks like a little duck's face with a little beak and head and eye and everything. That's the third ventricle. And the one down here in the brain stem that's going to be the fourth ventricle. fourth ventricle will lead into the central canal of the spinal cord. Okay, with surface markings, first off you're going to have your frontal lobe, which is going to be motor stuff. You'll have your, and then your, be, that will be divided from the parietal lobe, which is this medium blue color here, by this called the central sulcus. So, all the frontal lobe is motor. Parietal lobe, occipital lobe and temporal lobe, these guys, these are all sensory, all right? So the central sulcus separates motor from sensory, all right? Also, you're going to have your lateral sulcus, which is right here. That's going to separate the frontal lobe from the temporal lobe, and it's going to separate the parietal lobe from the temporal lobe. Next one, we have our parietal occipital sulcus, so I'll separate the parietal lobe from the occipital lobe. We're going to have a longitudinal fissure, which is going to go lengthwise. Let's see if we got in the next one. Here's our longitudinal fissure to separate our two hemispheres. You'll have your, you'll have your transverse cerebral fissure, which will, let's see if we see that in this one better. Transverse cerebral fissure will separate the cerebellum from the cerebrum. And then you're just going to have our five lobes. So like we said, frontal lobe, parietal lobe, 
occipital lobe, temporal lobe, and the insula. It's going to be in there. All right. So frontal lobe, parietal lobe, this will be your central sulcus. All right. Back here, you're going to have your occipital lobe. Okay, here's your temporal lobe here with our longitudinal fissure with our longitudinal, with our transverse fissure. Okay, so our cerebral cortex is going to have thin 2 to 4 millimeter layer of gray matter on the outside. It's going to make up 40% of the mass of the brain. This is going to be where your conscious mind is. If this is damaged or this is hurt, you're not going to be conscious. You're not going to be able to have your higher levels of thinking. Each hemisphere is going to be connected to the opposite side of the body. So each hemisphere connects the contralateral side of the body. So my left hemisphere of my brain does the right side of my body. The right hemisphere of my brain does the left side of my body. Within it, there's going to be three types of areas. There's going to be motor areas, which control our voluntary movement. There's going to be sensory areas, which control our awareness of sensation. So that's going to be interact with our environment and let us know what's around us. And then there's association areas. These will connect sensory areas and motor areas and sensory areas to sensory areas and motor areas to motor areas and motor areas to sensory areas. So these kind of connect everything together. All right, so looking here, we're going to have our motor areas. So first off, we get our primary motor cortex. Then we get our pre, which is before, motor cortex. All right, and then up here, you're going to get your frontal eye field right here is your frontal eye field. This is Broca's area. This is going to be responsible for speech. Frontal eye field, premotor cortex, motor cortex. On our next slide, we see this little guy called the homunculus. Homunculus or homunculi. Homunculi would be little men. Homunculus is little man. So there's a motor homunculus and there's a sensory homunculus. So we're looking at the primary motor cortex here, so front, back. So this is the motor, we're looking right here. If you notice, stuff that has a great deal of fine motor movement has a large area on the homunculus. Stuff that has a small amount of motor movement has a small area on the homunculus, like your toes. You don't have fine motor movement of your toes or elbow. You have lots of motor movement of your tongue and lips and facial muscles of facial expression and your fingers, right? And then as you work your way down into your arm and leg, there's not many fine motor movements and even less in your foot, all right? Here, this is the sensory sulcus or sensory homunculus. Tons of sensation in your tongue and in the mouth and on the face and on the hand. Not much on the back of your head and the body and the arm and all that stuff. Okay, so this once again represents the area controlled by the primary sensory sulcus and the areas controlled by the primary motor sulcus. The more nerves they have going to it or the more control, the larger area they take up here, the more nerves or the more sensation they have, the more area they take up. Okay, so with our Sensory areas, the sensory areas will be found posterior to the central sulcus. You'll have your primary sensory cortex. You'll have your association cortex. All right, coming in here, you're going to have Wernicke's area. Just in front of it, you're going to have your auditory association area and your auditory cortex. All right, working our way back visual cortex and then there's a visual association area so the way these work is like this takes in the information of what you're seeing visually and then the association area is going to be there to link it with like a past experience so to do so it's going to say oh did this i oh i see apple pie i know i like apple pie apple pie is yummy i've we've had it before it is a, we've we recognize that as a friendly thing all right and then coming up here we're going to have your gustatory cortex which is going to be inside the insula. I think it's on a couple slides ahead. So it's inside the insula. This is the insula. If you pull apart the if you pull apart at the transverse fissure, 
you'll see the insole just inferior deep to it. Okay, with your somatosensory association cortex, that's going to be posterior to the primary somatosensory cortex. So here's our somatosensory cortex. Somatosensory association is right behind it. All right, it's going to integrate sensory input from the primary, and it's going to help you determine stuff like size, texture, shape, relationships of different things that you're feeling. So if you feel oh, like uh, if you feel I'm feeling my desk right now, it's kind of smooth with with a slight amount of texture to it and it's kind of cool to touch also. So this would be responsible for that. Your auditory areas, so there's going to be a primary and association. So the primary is going to be a superior margin of the temporal lobes. You can see that from the past picture. This is going to um, interpret information from your inner ear and it's going to give you pitch, loudness, and location of a sound. The association areas are going to store memories of the sound and they're going to let you perceive what you're hearing. So right now you're hearing me yap. You're, you're taking these funny sounds that I'm making and interpreting them as words and information to use. Visual cortex. All right, this is going to receive, receive light and visual information from the retinas. And the association areas, like I said, that's going to be, that's going to take past information and make it useful to you. So um, right now I'm looking at a pen. It is brown, or sorry, it's brown, it's blue, and it's got a cap on it. So I, based on prior knowledge, I know that I remove the cap and I can write and make letters with it or make, make shapes with it. Okay, so with your olfactory and gustatory, we said that's gonna be in the insula. So your, so that's gonna be your area of conscious awareness of odors and the gustatory cortex is going to help you with perception of taste. With your visceral sensory areas, that's going to be posterior to the gustatory cortex. That's going to help out with conscious perception of visceral sensations. Vestibular cortex, this is going to be posterior part of the insula. Okay, it's going to be your responsible for um, conscious awareness of balance. So vestibular is balance. All right, here's just another view. With our multimodal, we're going to have three types of things here. We're going to have anterior association area, we're going to have a posterior association area, and we're going to have limbic association areas. So with our anterior association areas, these are going to be the most complicated in your cortex. This is what is going to make you intelligent it's going to give you your cognitive thought and it's going to make you you. It's going to give you your personality. This is going to be where you'll find your working memory and it's going to be what gives us judgment. All right. This is going to depend on your social environment. All right. So this is based on nature. This is based on how you were raised and where you grew up. And it's also going to be linked to your limbic system. So there's going to be some emotional connect here. So this is going to help help you um, have an emotional response or feeling connected to whatever you're doing. All right, with your limbic association area, once again, this is going to give you an emotional impact. So this is going to help you establish memories with emotion. And then your posterior association areas, it's going to be mostly in the temporal, parietal, and occipital lobes. These are going to help you with like recognizing people's faces and localize and and um, recognizing spoken language. So that'll be Wernicke's area is going to be spoken language and written language. Okay, so we got these things. We have lateralization, cerebral dominance, and cerebral dominance. Lateralization means you can be a right brain person or a left brain person, or you could be some combination of the two. Most people are left brain people. That means that most people are very good with logic and understanding math and language. Right brain people, those type of people are usually going to be more like the artsy type of people. Your right and left sides of the brain, they're going to talk via fibers inside the tracks. Okay, so those fibers, we're going to have different ones. We have commissures, which are going to connect the right and left sides of the brain. We're going to have association fibers, which connect the same side of the brain, the same like all in the left side or all in the right side. And you're going to have projection fibers, which go from the brain out to the body. So here we got commissural fibers connecting left to right. We got association fibers staying within the same hemisphere here.
these pink lines. And then we're going to have projection fibers actually leaving the brain, going, going south. Okay, so we have our basal nuclei. It's going to consist of the corpus striatum. You're going to have your caudate nucleus and your lentiform nucleus. But you'll see it better on here. So here's your caudate nucleus. And then you'll have your lentiform nucleus, which is this. It's made up of the putamen and the globus pallidus. And they call it the stri corpus striatum. You see that? So striations, there's lines. It's your caudate nucleus, your putamen, and the globus pallidus. So what are the functions of our basal nuclei? Um, it's not 100% known. What we think they do is we think they are going to have some control over muscular, over muscles and muscular tone. And we think they're going to help with, uh, with, with the intensity of your stereotype movements. So this is kind of another environmental factor, like how you think you should move and how you're acting. Okay, so your diencephalon is going to have three parts. You're going to have your hypo, which is below, thalamus. You're going to have your thalamus. And then you're going to have your epithalamus, which is going to be in back. Epi is above. All right, so your thalamus is going to take up most of the diencephalon. It's going to be made up of numerous nuclei, and their nuclei are going to be named based on their location. So like, like this is the anterior group. This is the um, ventral anterior one. This is the ventral lateral one. This is the ventral posterior. So it's kind of, they're just named based off of their location. I look at this as being like a server or a router, maybe. This is going to take information in and it's going to, it's going to send it to the right area of the brain. So information will stop in the thalamus and it'll get sent up to the part of the brain where it belongs based on what information is coming into the thalamus. So it's going to be a gateway to the cortex. It's going to sort, edit, and relay information. It'll mediate sensations, motor activities, learning, and memory. So it's going to be there to kind of tie everything together and make sure stuff is going to the right place. Your hypothalamus, once again, it's going to have a whole bunch of nuclei in it. It's going to be there for autonomic control of uh, many different uh, organs. Um, it's going to have your it's going to have your homeostatic mechanisms in there for temperature and food intake and water balance and thirst and your sleep cycle. So there's going to be a lot of stuff going on with this guy. This is going to release hormones to control your anterior pituitary gland. All right. So there's this little thing sticking out called the infundibulum. It's a stalk that connects the pituitary gland to the hypothalamus hypothalamus can control the pituitary gland with hormones. All right, our epithalamus is going to be the most dorsal portion of the diencephalon, so it's going to be way back here, and it's going to have a pineal gland coming from the back of it. The pineal gland is going to be responsible to make melatonin, and that is going to help with your circadian rhythm, your sleep cycle. Okay, working our way down, we got our brainstem. So within the brainstem, we'll have your midbrain, pons and medulla. We'll go through each of these. All right? So you get your you get your midbrain, pons and medulla. This is a very nice picture for me to look at the cranial nerves. I like to use this picture to ask questions of cranial nerves. So we'll go over cranial nerves in the next lecture, but you're going to be responsible for the names of all the cranial nerves and the basic functions of all the cranial nerves. So the midbrain is going to be in the middle of your brain. It's going to be located between the diencephalon and the pons. All right. There's going to be pyramidal motor tracts, and it's going to be um, there's going to be a channel that's going to connect the third and fourth ventricles here. Okay. So here's our cerebral aqueduct. Okay. So we'll have our corpus quadrinium, which is going to be a dome-like projection in the dorsal area okay you're gonna have your superior and inferior colliculi superior colliculi give you visual reflexes so if somebody throws a ball at you you quickly know to try to dodge it or grab it and inferior colliculi are auditory relay so if like I if you were in class and I go boom and I whack the desk kind of makes you jump right so that would do that would be responsible for your auditory um, relay centers and auditory type of reflexes 
pons. It's going to form the anterior wall of the fourth ventricle. So let's go back a couple slides. Here's your pons. Fibers in the pons are going to connect to higher brain functions. All right, the cranial nerves that are going to come off of it are going to be your trigeminal nerve, your abducens, and your facial. Trigeminal nerve is five, abducens is six, and facial is seven. Big function that's going to be helping here is it's going to help with the normal rhythm of breathing. Another name for the little area of that is called the pneumotaxic center. And then last one, medulla oblongata. All right, it's going to help with, um, it's going to join the spinal cord at the foramen magnum. So it's going to be the connection between the brain stem and the spinal cord. All right, Cran cranial nerves coming off of here are going to be cranial nerve 8, 10, and 12. Okay, stuff that your medulla is going to control, it's going to have autonomic reflex centers. And what those will be for is cardiovascular center and respiratory center and then a couple other ones. So respiratory center, okay, you'll have vaso, you'll have vasomotor stuff to control blood vessel diameter to open or close them and actually control heart rate. With respiratory center, this is going to make sure that your respiratory rhythm is smooth. So when you're breathing, it's very smooth breathing in and out. It's going to control the rate and depth. Other stuff, vomiting, hiccuping, swallowing, coughing, and sneezing will all be controlled by the medulla and those will all be reflexive. <clears throat> With the cerebellum, okay, it is described as what's called arbor vitae, so this is like tree-like projections or branch-like projections coming out of here. Each, it's going to be separated into a right and left hemisphere and each hemisphere is going to have three lobes. Okay, going further into our brainstem, you're going to find your limbic system inside the brainstem. All right, your limbic system is going to be responsible for emotions. And it's going to be structures on the medial aspect of the cerebral hemispheres. Okay. With our limbic system, like we were saying, you're going to have emotional or affective brain. So we'll have our amygdala and cingulate gyrus. Your amygdala is going to recognize angry or fearful facial expressions, so it'll let you assess fear or danger. Your cingulate gyrus is going to help you um, relate or express your emotions via gestures. Okay. And it's also going to help you put an emotion to an odor. So Skunks smell bad. You look at a skunk, you smell a skunk, it gives you bad thoughts, bad feelings towards it. Okay, next one's our reticular activating system. The reticular activating system is going to be there to filter out all the junk information going to your brain. We have so many receptors to, around our body taking in so much information. All right, what this does is this is just going to take out all the weak stuff. So, for example, how many of you feel that you are wearing a pair of socks or a pair of shorts or pants or whatever right now? You probably don't, except for the reason I just told you that you were feeling it. The reason why is this guy is going to filter out repetitive weak stimuli. That is not going to bother you. If this gets injured, you can be this. This is going to be one of the big reasons why people go into a coma. All right. It's going gonna, it's gonna to have motor functions, okay? Once again, it's going to help with vasomotor, so it's going to help with um, your blood vessels if they constrict, which close down, or dilate, which would mean they open up. It's going to help with heart rate and your respiratory centers. Okay, so an EEG, electroencephalogram. This is going to change with your age. It can change with brain disease. The gist of what it's used for is it's used to see are there tumors or brain lesions? Are there problems going on with the brain? Within an EEG, there's going to be four main types of um, waves that you're going to look for. Alpha waves, which we see here in the blue off to the right on this page. Beta waves, theta waves, and delta waves. Alpha waves are going to be when you're awake and relax. Beta waves are going to be when you're awake and alert. Theta waves are going to be common in kids. It's going to be, uh, it's not very common in adults. And then delta waves are if you're in like a deep sleep. So how do we protect the brain? There's going to be your skull. 
there's going to be your meninges. There's going to be a watery cushion called your cerebral spinal fluid or CSF. And there's going to be your blood brain barrier. Blood brain barrier will be there to keep out, to keep out bacteria in large debris from getting into the CSF. Cerebral spinal fluid is like a cushion, kind of like a baby is in its amniotic sac. It's got a large cushion barrier. The meninges, those will be like a tough fibrous coat around it. And then the bone, the skull, I mean, it's kind of self-explanatory. Okay, so your meninges are going to cover the central nervous system, all of it, all right? There's going to be three layers to them. There's a dura mater, which you see here. There's a arachnoid mater. There's a pia mater. Dura is in it's a durable, tough outer coat. Arachnoid is in, if you see these, see this in here, you see these little projections in here, it looks like a spider web, so or cobwebs. So it's arachnoid is in spider. And then pia is going to be the innermost layer. So your dura mater, like we said, it's the tough fibrous outer coat. It's gonna it's gonna help hold the brain in place. Okay. Next layer in is going to be your arachnoid model. It's going to be the middle layer. And between the dura mater and the arachnoid mater is called the subdural space. Between the arachnoid mater and pia mater is called the subarachnoid space. The subarachnoid space is where you're going to find your cerebral spinal fluid. Okay, You're going to have these things called arachnoid villi, which are going to allow cerebral spinal fluid to get reabsorbed and remade. And then the last one is going to be your Pia mater. It's going to be like almost a layer of saran wrap wrapped around the brain to hold everything in tight. It's going to be well vascularized and it's just going to hold tightly to the brain. It literally looks like there's a layer of saran wrap on the brain. That's the pia mater. Okay, so cerebral spinal fluid is going to be a watery solution. It'll have less proteins and it'll have different ions in it than plasma. So what happens is basically blood tries to get to the brain and all the red blood cells in some of the proteins and um, many of the ions get filtered out and we just let the fluid portion of the blood go through. Okay, it's there to give the central nervous organs buoyancy. They're basically floating in place and it's going to be there to be like a protective barrier if you get hit. They're going to protect the central nervous system from like traumas. Okay, so we have our choroid plexus. First off, we start off here. With number one, cerebral spinal fluid is going to be produced by the choroid plexus in each ventricle. Next, cerebral spinal fluid is going to flow through the ventricles into the subarachnoid space via the median and lateral apertures. Okay, some of the cerebral spinal fluid flows into the central canal of the spinal cord. Other ones are just going to stay in the brain. <clears throat> Moving on, cerebral spinal fluid will go through the subarachnoid space. And then finally, the cerebral spinal fluid will be reabsorbed into the dural venous sinuses via our arachnoid villi. So I see these projections up here. So our blood-brain barrier, like we said, that's going to separate the blood from the brain. We don't let the blood go to the brain because if there's a septic infection in the blood, we don't want it to be able to get to the brain. So it's almost going to be like a screen filtration system that only lets fluid through and not large objects like a bacterial cell or a red blood cell or even some proteins. So it's a selective barrier and it'll allow nutrients to move by facilitated diffusion. It'll block metabolic waste, proteins, many drugs, all right? It'll allow most stuff that's fat soluble to pass through. Some stuff includes alcohol and nicotine. Spinal cord is going to start at your foramen magnum. So it will start at the base of your skull. <clears throat> it, it will end at L1. The end of your spinal cord is called the conus medullaris. The the ner at the end though, your spinal, there's a bunch of nerves coming off of there and they are referred to as the cauda equina. Cauda equina means horse's tail. So they, whoever saw this for the first time thought these looked like a horse's, or decided to name it, thought this looked like a horse's tail, all the nerves coming down off of here. It's going to act as a two-way tract. It'll send information, sensory information up to the brain and it will take motor information from the brain and send it down. Okay, so the cerebral spinal fluid is going to have its 
it's going to have cerebral spinal fluid. The spinal cord is also going to have cerebral spinal fluid in it. All right. And the reason why if you get a epidural shot is epidural. So it'll be above the dura. What's going to happen is they're going to want to inject it into your uh, cerebral spinal fluid. They like to go in around L4, L5. Why? If you look here, here's the conus medullaris and here's the cauda equina. As we get further and further along, the cauda equina thins out because we're sending off nerves through all these spinal roots here. So if we go in between L5 and L4, there's not as many nerves to hit. Or if we do get in there, the cauda equina should just move out of the way. There's going to be another thing running through here called the phylum terminale. What it does is it connects the conus medullaris to the coccyx. So it's just going to be there to kind of hold the spinal cord in place. Okay. Also around there, there's going to be a cushion network of fat, veins, and all kinds of other stuff to help protect it and hold everything in place. Okay, so we're looking at cross-sectional anatomy of the spinal cord. There's going to be a dorsal medium fissure in the back and a ventral medium fissure in the front. Dorsal medium fissure is thinner, ventral medium fissure is thicker. All right, and then there's going to be dorsal horns and ventral horns of gray matter within the spinal cord. All right, dorsal horns are in back, ventral horns are up front. And then there's going to be a gray commissure, which will connect right and left sides. All right, so we get our dorsal horns in back, ventral horns in front. Dorsal horns are going to be taking in sensory information, ventral horns will be sending out motor information. Also, we can find lateral horns in these, you can see it better here, do you see this bump out right here? That's a lateral horn. Those will only be present in the thoracic spinal cord and those will be there for sympathetic type response. Okay, so dorsal horn, ventral horn. So I would draw like arrows traveling this way. Sensory information comes into the dorsal horn, motor information leaves the ventral horn. So you get our, we get our sensory input coming in, you get your inner neurons in here thinking about it, and then here we'll have visceral, visceral motor nerves or visceral autonomic nerves, and then here you get your somatic nerves. Okay, so white matter. White matter inside the cord, it's going to be tracks. Some tracks will go up to the brain. Those are sensory, sensory afferent, sensory ascending. Descending are going to be motor, motor efferent. Do you remember? It's always the same. Sensory afferent, motor efferent. So sensory are ascending, motor are descending. And then we'll get transverse tracks, which will be commissural. So those will connect the left and right sides. They'll be crossing the spinal cord. All the major tracks, they're going to be paired and they're going to have multi neurons, uh, multiple neurons going through them. So if you have one on the left side, you're going to have the same one on the right side. All right. Um, many of the, all the paths are going to cross over. Some of them are going to cross over up in the brainstem. Some of them are going to cross over at the level of innervation. All right. And most of these tracks are going to have two or three different neurons. The first neuron will be called a first order neuron, that'll be the receptor to the spinal cord. So I take in information, I touch something hot, it's the nerve that connects my fingertip to my spinal cord. Second order neuron will be the inner neuron, it'll connect the spinal cord up to the brain. Then the third order neuron would go from like the thalamus out to wherever else it's going in the brain. Not all things are going to have a third order neuron. Okay, so when we're sending somatosensory stuff up, it can be in the dorsal column, medium lamiscus. This goes by DCML. This is going to control touch and vibration. Or it can go by the spinal thalamic. This will be pain, temperature, coarse touch. Why is it nice to know these and know their locations? Well, if I get an injury to the spinal cord, I can know is it more towards the back? All right towards our, is it more towards the back 
or is it more towards like the cer uh, spinal cerebral tract? Okay, why does it matter? If you get if you get damage to the cord, based on where the damage to the cord is, it's going to matter which tracks it'll affect. So you know, oh, this person's having problems with touch and vibration feelings, but they still have feeling of pain, temperature, and coarse touch. So we can say, oh, it probably affected this tract. So these are kind of nice to know. And then our spinal cerebral tracts, all right? These are only first and second order neurons. These guys are going to be there for Golgi tendon organ and perception. So this is going to be telling you the amount of tension within your muscles, and it's going to let you know where you are in space. It's going to let you know where your body is in space. You have conscious recognition of where your body is in space, all right? Descending pathways, they can be direct or they can be indirect. Direct are going to be fast, finely controlled motor skills, okay? Indirect will be more coarse stuff like balance and posture, stuff like that. With them, there's going to be two types of neurons. There will be upper motor neurons, which will be coming from the primary motor cortex, and there will be mo lower motor neurons, which will be coming from the spinal cord. These are from the brain. These are from the spinal cord. Okay? With our descending pathways, we'll get our ventral cortical spinal tracts, and our lateral cortical spinal tracts, all right? The ventral tracts, the important thing to know is we said the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body, left side of the brain, right side of the body. <clears throat> the ventral cortical spinal tracts cross over in the brain or in the midbrain. Actually, in the, in the uh, brain stem. The lateral cortical spinal tracts will cross over at the level of innervation, at the level where the nerve is going to come out. Okay, with our spinal cord traumas, you can have functional loss, which means a paresthesia is their sensory loss, or paralysis would be loss of motor function. If you get flaccid paralysis, that means that you're going to have severe nerve damage and you're going to have complete loss of function to a certain area. If you get spastic paralysis, this is going to be an upper motor neuron lesion. So you'll have something going on in the brain. And what happens is you don't have any control over the muscle. It'll just kind of like flail and do its own thing, whatever it wants to do. A lot of times these muscles just become contorted and contracted. If you think of somebody who has like a stroke and their, and their hand is just contracted and it's held up against their body and they can't relax it, that's going to be more of like an upper motor neuron lesion where you get spastic paralysis and the muscles just under constant contraction or it'll just be limp and it'll just contract every once in a while on its own. And then we get transection, all right? This will be cross section of the spinal cord at any level. Based on where it happens will be based on what you lose, okay? If you're quadriplegic, you lose everything, it's going to be something happened up in your cervical region. So you lose function of your arms and legs. If you lose your um, function of your legs happens somewhere between T1 and L1. Okay, so polio. Polio is going to be destruction of the ventral horn motor neurons. Okay, so if we get, we say our ventral horn is our lower motor neurons. And if you affect those lower motor neurons, you get flaccid paralysis. So you'll get atrophy of your muscles. Over time, what can happen is this can affect the muscles for respiration and you can't breathe, and you can go into cardiac arrest. Okay, ALS, amyotropic lateral sclerosis. Another name for this is Lou Gehrig's disease. This is going to be, once again, destruction of the ventral horn motor neurons, and it'll help with the pyramidal strap. Uh, it'll be destroying the pyramidal tract. What this does is you're going to lose your ability to breathe. That's going to be the ultimate one that's going to end up taking you out. Okay, with developmental aspects of the central nervous system, it's going to be it's going to be established in your first month of development. You'll have gender specific areas. These can either be turned on or turned off based on the presence of testosterone. There's going to be maternal exposure to radiation or drugs or alcohol or opiate stuff like that. That can cause lots of damage to the central nervous system. That's the reason why pregnant moms should not be smoking. They should not be drinking alcohol, they shouldn't be doing drugs, they need to watch out even what types of uh, over-the-counter drugs they're taking. And then last one, smoking. If you're smoking, it decreases the amount of oxygen in the blood. 
All right, if you decrease the amount of oxygen in the blood in an adult, they're okay. With a fetus, that can cause severe brain damage. It can even cause death to certain cells in the brain, which might not ever regenerate. All right, as you get older, as we spoke of in the last chapter, your nerve cells don't really replicate in your central nervous system. So you can have some cognitive decline as some cells start to die off or as they're going to be uh, decreasing in their, in their uh, optimal function, okay? You really don't get any changes like this until you start getting into your mid to late 80s. Also what happens is shrinkage of the brain is going to accelerate at older age. Um, and one of the things that they think are attached with this is excessive use of alcohol. 